Just move your attention away from that heaviness. Keep it light. Keep a sense of humor. Move your attention into the present moment. That break in the clouds can come. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real-life strategies. This is going to help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. Hey guys, it's Kathy Heller. Welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. How are you? What is up? How is your day going? Subscribe to our show. It really helps. And tell your friends to subscribe to our show. I was thinking one way that it could be win, win, win is if you subscribe to the show and you share the show with a friend and then you use it as a means to keep each other accountable. So when you're inspired by something that one of our guests says or you're inspired by something we're talking about on the show, choose a person who you want to share the show with and make a plan that once a week you're going to listen to the episodes and talk to each other and remind one another of what they have to do in this world and support each other, fly each other's flag, be each other's cheerleader so that this inspiration actually turns into results that every week you get closer to carving out the life that you want, to chipping away at making your dream a reality. Today's Passover and I was thinking that true freedom is really a state of mind. True freedom, you know, yes, you could be free from something that's keeping you bound but inside yourself, the key is really to be free inside yourself, to be free from things that hold you back, from thoughts that keep you down. I've loved seeing the work that you guys have sent, and thank you guys for sending in your work. If you guys want more instruction on how to send me your work, I will be talking about my favorites in a few more weeks. You can go to nodayjobs.com and find out some instructions to send me your work. Also, I'm gonna be launching something free for all of the people on my mailing list, so go to nodayjobs.com and you'll be the first to know about something really fun. We are all called to do something else, and that is our job. Job. Every day, our job is to figure out why are we here? You're all here for a specific purpose and you know it. What is that thing that lights you up that you just can't stop thinking about, that you've got to do, that when you think about it, your heart just beats a little bit faster? That's the thing that you're put here to do because here's the deal. Our job is to be the greatest, most authentic expression of ourselves. That's our job. So instead of saying to yourself, well, what does it matter if I like to be an illustrator? Or what does it matter if I'm, how am I going to really save the world if I'm making pottery or if I'm baking? I'm telling you this, if you are your most authentic, happy version of you, that is the best thing you can do to make a difference in this world, in this country, whatever you're thinking about. If you can get busy working on you and you're here to be a vehicle to inspire others, you're here to be yourself, so therefore you're gonna inspire other people to be themselves. So if somebody else has a dream to be writing or singing or creating something else, by seeing you do your thing, you're gonna show them that that mountain is completely possible to climb. Does that make sense? So I want you to get busy thinking about what can you do and how can you get out of your own way and get it done. We've all been there. And here's the deal, the pain, the pain that all of us have been through, that's just going to make you victorious. You know what I'm saying? Everybody you've ever looked up to in your life, this isn't somebody who you look up to because they had it easy. You look up to them because they went right through it. Instead of trying to go around it, instead of looking for the easy way out, we sit with it, we go through it. So on today's episode, I'm bringing on someone who's actually been so instrumental in my own life. Years ago, I was working on a show for the Jim Henson Company and Lisa Henson asked me to go to this retreat for mindfulness and I didn't know what that was and I wasn't really sure, but I just went with an open mind. I sat down and it was a whole day of learning how to meditate and be peaceful and feel our feelings. Well, within an hour of sitting on that cushion, I just wanted to run straight out of the room. My whole body was in so much pain physically. I felt like if you did an x-ray, you would see how much pain my whole body was in. And it was all psychological pain because I had been running for so long. I didn't want to sit with what I was feeling. You know, everyone has their story. Over a period of time, I started studying mindfulness. I started going to classes at UCLA at the Mindful Awareness Research Center. And I started to experience what it felt like to separate from my thoughts, to separate from these things that I was just slowly going down the rabbit hole and chasing these thoughts and believing these thoughts. And so of course I'd want to distract from them. And I learned how to put some space between myself and these thoughts. And I learned that I'm so much bigger 
And that always within reach is this part of us that is so peaceful, that is so whole. I learned that there's this metaphor like the ocean. You know how like if you go down in the ocean, like five feet, 20 feet, a mile, it's completely still and it's deafeningly silent. It's so peaceful. But if you look up and you look up at the top layer of the ocean, it's always a little bit choppy because it's dealing with the weather. But the ocean itself, the majority of the ocean is so heavy and still and peaceful. But because of the weather, the top layer of the ocean is usually responding to the wind. Well, that's what we are. Our thoughts are typically running around and stressed and thinking about all different kinds of things, the past, the future, anxiety, sadness, when really the majority of what we are is this wholeness and this stillness and this groundedness because we all have that inner knowing that everything is actually exactly as it needs to be and whatever has happened has only happened in a beautiful order because it was there to teach us something so that we could get to the next thing. So today I'm bringing on a person who has really inspired me and changed my life. Her name is Susan Kaiser Greenland, and she teaches mindfulness, and she's one of the experts teaching it all over the world. She's written two best-selling books. Her first book, The Mindful Child, was a bestseller, and her second book, which is called Mindful Games, is out, and there are now activity cards that accompany that new book, and they were just launched last week. They're selling really well. They're in the top few hundred on Amazon. Go check them out. She's been teaching mindfulness, but what's also awesome about Susan is that she's also one of us. She started out as a lawyer and she liked it. She was a successful lawyer and she started to look into other kinds of things and we're gonna get to hear her story today, but eventually she became a person teaching mindfulness and I think she's even more successful today making a better living and serving her mission and her life's work than she ever did as a lawyer. And I can't wait to dive in and hear her story, but I hope through the course of the story that a few things that you can take away from this start to help you so that every single day not only do we need to realize that we need to do stuff with our action but our thoughts create our action our feelings determine our action so our intention has to start with a peaceful state a beautiful state we have to be able to move our thoughts from the direction of things that are stressful to things that are helpful to things that serve us so i hope that today throughout the course of listening to susan's journey that we will also ask her some questions of how we can start to apply mindfulness to our own lives and it's not heebie-jeebie and it's not hocus pocus they've done so many studies and it's really true we as human beings we can change our own physiology and our own nervous system completely depends upon what we're thinking and and our thoughts direct our feelings and our feelings then direct our actions so if we really want to get the most mileage out of our life we have to figure out a way to choose what we're gonna think and to choose what's gonna really be the best stuff. So if there's stuff that you love that comes out of this podcast, write it down, put it on a post-it note, remind yourself, start to fill yourself up with the thoughts that serve you, with the things that empower you. You were born to inspire others and I want you to trust and step out on faith that if you have the passion for something, you're gonna contribute by doing the thing you're passionate about. All right, so now we're gonna bring on Susan. I'm so happy you're here. I can't wait to dive in and hear your whole story. Susan, are you there? Yeah, hi, Kathy, how are you doing? I'm good, we're so lucky to have you on the show right now. Thank you for making the time. Oh, I'm happy to be here and I'm so excited to watch your career just take off and to hear that you've got this podcast. I'm very, very excited for you. Well, thank you, it's really, really fun. and. You know, things that make you happy are good things to keep doing. So I want to talk a little bit about your story and how you wound up where you are being one of the thought leaders, experts in the mindfulness world. How did you get there? And I know that you were doing something else in the beginning of your career. So what was that path like? Can you take us through that story a little bit? I actually was a lawyer for owned and operated radio and television stations, network owned and operated radio and television stations in New York. And I loved that work. I'm not one of those like recovering lawyers who hated their work. I actually enjoyed it. But what ended up happening was that I ended up um, learning to meditate in kind of a funny way and then ended up sharing that meditation with kids. And one thing led to another and I ended up transitioning into a different type of work. So being a lawyer is pretty different than teaching mindfulness all over the world. So so take us back. So you're a lawyer and you were a successful lawyer and you're liking it. You're doing that. And how do you then go to becoming 
a mindfulness expert writing books and teaching people all over the world. Well, what happened was I was pregnant with my son, who's now 23. Right. And my husband got a pretty lousy health uh, diagnosis that was not good. And I was working as a lawyer and um, all, and he's fine now, by the way. He's actually living here in LA with all of us. So everything worked out. But what happened was we had to start looking for all different types of ways that might be able to help him in the healing process. And I know you probably think I'm going to go to meditation, but I'm not. What I'm going to tell you is that I started reading about food and I became absolutely convinced that we were all eating poison, the processed foods, the white flours, the sugar. So I would go work all day. Remember, I've got a, I'm pregnant and I've got a toddler at home. I mean, Kathy, you know what that's like to be working and having that at home. Yeah. And I would come home and one night I was up on a stool in a small New York apartment kitchen pulling out of the cupboards absolutely everything that might have had some processed food in it, so, you know, processed ingredients or chemicals and throwing them into a big black garbage bag. And Seth comes in and says, hey, honey, I got a babysitter. We're going out tonight. I said, oh, I can't. I got to get all this poison out of our refrigerator and out of our closets and get rid of this flour and this sugar. And he said, no, no, we're going to go learn to meditate. So I stopped for a minute and I thought, okay, the guy's got cancer. He wants to learn to meditate. The least I can do is go with him. <laughs> so I so I changed my uh, plans and I say, okay, we'll go. It's fine because I know it's really important for you to learn to meditate. He said, no, 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 Susan, you've got this wrong. You need to learn to meditate because wow. you're driving me crazy. <laughs> So that's how I learned to meditate. And then like your description of what happened to you, Kathy, I know Kathy well for people who are listening and don't know us. I think we're wired in a similar way. When I actually got to that Zen center and sat down on a cushion, I just couldn't stay still. I I lasted just a couple of minutes and my husband stayed the whole uh, sitting period. And I just went flying off that cushion and out onto the streets in New York to wait for him to finish. It almost like fit hurts like it's it's really painful it's like a sunburn it's really hard the first few times well it depends i mean some people find it just blissful and people have different reactions i mean that's true. that was just my experience yeah i mean your reaction and mine were similar in that mine was not my head was very busy i mean some people who have trouble or just their thoughts keep going mine was really a body based reaction i felt like i was just going to jump out of my skin and i did i actually just ran out of that zen center like like it was on fire. So that's how I started. Eventually, I ended up learning. But if I knew then what I know now, I would never have started a practice during such an unbelievably stressful time. Sitting still, I would have started with a movement based practice or something else. We'll get to this later. But that's what I love about your work, because it's bite sized. And it's meant, you know, for children for teenagers, but I think it's actually so powerful for adults. We'll talk about that later. So what happened next? Well, next, my husband got better, we moved to Los Angeles, the kids were born, and they get into school. And then and then I started actually studying meditation quite seriously out here with a American teacher from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Although all my work is secular and my family, my kids were born bat mitzvah and all of that. So going to Buddhist sanghas was not a good fit for our family. I have studied Buddhist meditation very seriously and then adapted those practices or translated them for a secular off audience and for a modern audience. And then yeah. I thought, wow, maybe this would help kids. So I started using my kids as a guinea pig, and we did it at home. And then I started volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club and then at schools. And before you knew it, before I knew it, I was doing that more with more time than I was practicing law. So eventually I segued out of the law practice into this full time. Wow. And now... You've written two best-selling books, and you've spoken in how many countries? You've spoken everywhere. A lot. Yeah, yeah, a lot. I love that, too, so I'm lucky. And I've got to tell you, Kathy, the law career, I truly believe, has really helped me with this work because what I really saw that I wanted to be able to do and other people do it too, but I thought it was a, a talent that I had was to translate this work to kind of get a, 
rid of the jargon, put it into plain English, and put it into simple context. And that's what I love doing. And I think that's really, if I have a contribution to offer, uh, that's something unique to what my voice, I think that's what it is. It's such an incredible gift you've given to the world, because as you said, not everybody is going to relate to Buddhism, even though I think it's pretty beautiful. But you were able to translate into a way for everybody to understand and find a place to welcome that in. And it's quite remarkable. And I've had the privilege of watching you teach. And you are just so kind, so centered, so not pretentious, so real. And it's such a blessing to know someone like you who is just shows up as a human being and makes space for other people, whatever it is that's going on with them. And yet you stay so grounded and so pleasant in your own space that I think it gives people permission to use that as an anchor, start to feel their feet on the ground, their sit bones, and they start to breathe. So let's talk a little bit about some of what you think are places where people could start. What are some practices that you think are things that people can incorporate, ideas that they could even think about that you think would be beneficial as people are moving through their their life? Well, I think there's a, a few basic concepts that once we are able to hold in mind, make so many of the other things we hear about mindfulness and meditation make sense. Because, you know, mindfulness and meditation have become very popular And as exciting and cool as that is, it's a little bit of a downside because there's some confusion around it. Sometimes people think it's just kind of a hippy-dippy California thing, or sometimes people over-promise about, you know, how mindfulness will cure all the ills that we have. So I think just a basic general understanding of the nervous system, which is what both you and I were talk, talking about, Kathy, in our origin stories, yeah. is a good place to, re, to begin. And where I like to begin is just thinking of mindfulness as kind of a wonderful one-two approach, like a one-two punch, although punch is a little aggressive word for this idea, uh, to help us be able to just navigate the world with more wisdom and compassion and equanimity. And the first piece of that one-two punch is mindfulness-based strategies that help us calm an overly excited nervous system. Because you know what happens when our nervous systems start start gearing up. What happens is something that Dan Siegel calls the window of tolerance, our ability to tolerate emotions. It's what you were talking about in the intro. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's a good thing because we get moving into more of a, a fight or flight approach, a sympathetic nervous system approach. And so we don't want to be thinking a lot when we're scared and we need to run away from danger. What we want to do is just be able to act quickly. So our bodies respond in that way by narrowing our capacity to really be able to reason. And instead, what we have instead is we become very reactive and inflexible and we just do what needs to be done. We get it done. And that's very, very useful if you've got your hand in a fire as far as just pulling that out. Yeah. When we see that coming, which happens all the time now these days, when we start feeling that stirring up or that activation, what mindfulness can do is it helps us de-escalate that response and move into a wider window of tolerance where we can tolerate more difficult feelings, where we are more open, where we're more receptive, where we're able to learn, where we're responsive rather than reactive. And how do we do that? It's really, really simple. We move our attention away from what we're worried about, what we're thinking about that's actually getting us more and more upset into a present moment experience, into the feeling in a body, for example, like the feeling of breathing or the feeling of our feet against the ground, something like that. Or if it's tough for you to move your attention into your body, you can move it to a word, a single word, or a slogan. A slogan that works really, really well is, this is what it is right now. Reminds us, okay, this is pretty lousy right now, but it's going to change. So once mindfulness has this way then of bringing the nervous system back more into a more baseline mode, more toward resting and digesting rather than fighting and flighting, once that happens, once we have this open, receptive, wide window where we can learn and be responsive and learn new things and listen to each other, 
then we can start viewing whatever's happening, whether it's good or whether it's bad, through the lens of a number of universal themes that are woven through any contemplative tradition, and also through psychology and philosophy and educational pedagogy. So those kind of themes are the ideas of practice, the idea of patience, the idea of kindness and compassion and acceptance. We can learn to tolerate that and being uncomfortable. And I, I just feel like that's one of the most powerful things we could talk about and people could learn how to incorporate in their life is learning to tolerate being uncomfortable. Because let's face it, you know, you're going to be in traffic. You're going to get rejected. Life isn't going to always go your way. And if you are going to have a reaction to that every time, that's going to be really unpleasant. It's not going to be so easy to get through things. So what might be something that somebody could start doing, like a bite-sized practice you think that a person could do? Well, I think the thing to remember if you're really just starting out with these practices is try them out for a short time, many times. That's why we call them mindful games. Just think of it as a game. You're just going to drop them into things that you're doing throughout the day. So a real useful, useful kind of mindful game is that when you're about ready to leave in the morning, if you're anything like we are around here, often rushing on the way out the door. If just before you get to the front door, if you just take a moment and you stop and you just notice the sensations in the bottom of your feet, you just feel your feet and you just stop, you breathe and you just move your attention away from what's moving in through your mind into the sensations in your feet, making sure that you're relaxing your body at the same time, because sometimes when we start noticing specific sensations, we tense up. So we really want to relax, let the tension drop out of our forehead, out of our shoulders, and move our attention into our feet, keeping our knees soft and our muscles relaxed. So then every time throughout the day, if you feel, okay, I feel like I'm tensing up, Just stop, whether you're seated in a chair, whether you're in the car and you've got your foot on the brake, not suggesting taking your foot off the brake, but if you're stuck in traffic and you're, or you're stuck at a, at a stoplight, just stop, relax your body, move your attention away from what you're thinking into the sensations in the bottoms of your feet. No, I'm not someone who's had that experience and I'm listening to that. How, how does that help a person doing that practice? How it helps us is, again, if we just go back to what the original one-two punch of this mindfulness powerful practice is, the first part of that practice is to help us calm. There's all sorts of different ways to help us calm down and to help us quiet our overly excited minds. And remember, our minds can be overly excited because we're very, very happy about something. It doesn't all need to be uh, just we're miserable about something. But sometimes, even if we're very, very happy about something and our minds are all jazzed up, it's, it's not pleasant, it's not useful, and it's hard to see clearly. So what we do when we notice that our minds are getting a little bit overly active or where we just really want to pause and chill out for a second is we move our attention away from what we're thinking about into a present moment experience. Sensation, the bottom of your feet, that's just that. What that will happen is you'll just start to notice a space open up. And all of a sudden, there's just a little glimpse of freedom. It's a glimpse of freedom from this thing that we have all day long of go, 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 do, 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 my email list, my grocery list, and all of the other things. So we just get a bit of space. It's like it's like in a rainy day like we've got here in L.A. It's like that moment when the sun shines through the clouds. You just get that for a second, and then it may cloud up again. But once you've seen that a couple of times, then things start to shift. Yeah, I think it's so, so useful. I I think everybody should be able to integrate this to have more equanimity in their life. And one of the reasons I think it's so important for for people listening to this show and thinking, how am I going to quit my day job, do what it is that I love? How does it relate even more so is because I've talked about how, you know, it's important to work smart instead of just working hard. And if you don't create space and you're just constantly thinking, 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 racing, 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 you're not going to step back and say, whoa, whoa, wait, let me make a plan and let me begin with the end in mind and let me choose what my next step is going to be instead of just listening to what next thought comes across my mind, which is going to prompt me to do the next thing. And then I'm kind of, you know, spinning my wheel sometimes instead of stepping back and like you said, seeing clearly. And 
One of the other just really simple things that I've learned from this that's so important, it sounds so simple, but it's really hard is, you know, you taught me the idea of like noticing your thoughts like clouds, you know, passing across your mind and seeing them. And you don't have to believe each one and you don't have to then take each one on a ride or let it take you on a ride and think a thousand more thoughts that come from that one thought, which could be really self-defeating or could be really negative or really stressful. And so often, I mean, I'm still constantly, you know, I'm just practicing mindfulness. I'm not an expert. I'll find myself caught up in some thought that's really stressful. That's like, it's like a loop and just keeps going. And I'll say, whoa, whoa, let me just take the space. And feeling your feet on the ground is like you said, it's that just gives a little window, just a little space. And then you can go back and then you can choose what's the next thing that's going to serve you. Gosh, how often are we all listening to this stuff? It's just such noise and it's really heavy sometimes, or it's not serving us and we're suffering. You know, we have these like headphones on all day that might be telling us things that are really stressful and not so helpful and not really true even, even, you know? You just wrote a book called Mindful Games. This is your second best-selling book. What else can you share with us that's in there that, that we might be able to integrate? I'm trying to think of things for your audience. So I think for people who are in that situation, which I think many of us are in all the time, we may not have a nine-to-five job, but we are. We always have a goal. I mean, think of how many times you know you set your goal, you meet it, But by the time you meet that goal, you've already set the new one. So you're not really able to appreciate, oh, wow, I did this. So one of the things that we can do when we start seeing this kind of a pattern is that's when we can start doing some reframing practices. And the reframing practices, I think, are very, very important. And they tie into the idea of a more mindful worldview or a wiser and more compassionate worldview. And we can't really move into those reframing practices or it's hard to do when our nervous systems are all jacked up. So that's why it's very important to learn these other practices that help us have a, you know, have a wider bandwidth so we can start thinking about other alternatives or other points of view. And the other thing that's really important when we're doing worldview practices about reframing is we don't pretend that the problems that we have aren't there. I mean, it's not about sweeping our problems under the rug. It's not about getting rid of emotions that we don't like. It's about acknowledging them but opening up our bandwidth to understand that there's there's more in our lives too. So let's say, for instance, somebody's sitting at a computer in an office and had planned on going home to have dinner with uh, some special people in their life or to go out with some special people, and all of a sudden they had to stay late at work, right? right? And they're stuck there. So we've got a couple of choices there. Either we can just tense up, right? So we get angry, we get mad, we feel bad. We can just tense up, which is usually what happens when those strong emotions come in. Or we can use it as an opportunity to repeat that slogan, which I find so unbelievably helpful. This is what it is right now. And implicit in that slogan is that means things are going to change. So this is what it is right now. It's really uncomfortable. It's not what I want but I'm going to just relax the muscles in my forehead. And then you move down your body. You're going to relax the muscles in your face, staying upright in your chair, relax the muscles in your shoulders, in your upper arms, in your lower arms, in your hands, in your chest, in your tummy, in your seat against the chair, in your upper legs, in your lower legs, in your feet, And now just really feeling your body sitting in the chair and just feeling the relaxation in your body. Just see if you can bring to mind three positive things right now that are in your life too. We're not pretending that it doesn't totally stink that you're stuck there at the office when you had other plans, but there's good in the life too. So we relax our bodies, we get into the moment, And we expand our horizon to realize that there's good with the bad. And that too has a way of just 
opening up the sky a crack, letting some light in, letting the light shine in. And then also when we're more physically relaxed and not all tensed up, it's easier to get our work done and go home. So those are that three good things can be modified in all sorts of ways. So let's say you're just annoyed that you're stuck working when you really want to be doing something else. When you feel those negative emotions, you acknowledge them, you feel them, but see if you can bring to mind three things that are going in the direction you want your career to go to. I had a yoga teacher once, I was on the mat, and she she said this to everybody. I was like almost in tears. I'm sitting in her class, and she said to everyone, I want to give you, I want to invite you to zip off your ego and put it next to you, and it'll be there when you're done. You could put it right back on. But for now, I'm just inviting you to take it off and be here and let go of the, the spinning thoughts and just feel your body right here on this mat. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. That's beautiful. And one of the things I love about that, and one of the other things that I think is so important for people who are listening to a show about quitting your day job and following your passion, is this idea, and it's one of the pieces that are really key and crucial to the worldview surrounding mindfulness and meditation, the dismantling and the easing of the ego. And the whole idea of when some rejection comes your way or when things aren't working out come you know start happening the hardest thing to do but maybe the most important thing to do besides relaxing your body and not tensing up is not to take it personally and one of the things that is very helpful in the not taking it personally department is just really remembering that there is no possible way no matter how we try or how hard we try that we will ever know all of the events in this tangled web of causes and conditions that led up to any particular decision. And you can be sure that it's not something to take personally, but it is really just something that is part and partial of daily life. So the more we can just let go, we're not only relaxing our body, we're relaxing this tight hold we have on ego or self or it's about me. And one of the reasons this is a complicated idea for many people to understand is because it takes a pretty strong sense of self in order to be able to let that go, right? Right. You've got to have a pretty good sense of who you are and a pretty healthy sense of who you are. It's not about getting rid of a sense of of being a, a strong, successful, wonderful person. It's just about also accepting that, you know, there's just so much we can do about anything only so much is in our control. So we do the best we can. And then we let the music play. And sometimes the music plays and things go well for us. And sometimes the music plays and it doesn't. And then we just move on to the next. I said it in the first book I wrote in The Mindful Child. And I said it very recently in a blog post about 2017 that, you know, because it might be a very unique year that we're going into politically. And I said, you know, if we can just remember to keep it simple and to, you know, keep our sense of humor and to keep it fun, then whatever we go through will be a whole lot easier. So I think when we're faced with these obstacles, if we just try to stay simple and not overcomplicate things, try to keep it as fun as possible and keep our sense of humor because when we're looking at the activity of our minds, it really is hilarious. I mean, the things we say to each uh, yeah. ourselves, you know, the things we think about, the loops we get into, I mean, they're funny. Yeah, I, I was recently watching something and it was saying how, you know, you might have had an art teacher who told you, you know, you're not that great. And you might have had a, a, an uncle who told you something else, but it'll never stack up to the amount of criticism you give yourself. And that's why it's yeah. so important to be able to at least notice it. And just the noticing of it might calm it down a little bit. Yeah. And that's where the mindfulness piece really does come in very handy, like throughout the day. Because like you said, we take it, it gets very heavy after a while. The burdens seem heavy. We take ourselves very seriously and our work very seriously. And that has a way of wearing us down, both mentally and physically. But if we're able to just, you know, take a break, take a mental break a few times a day, short period of time, frequently throughout the day. Day. Just move your attention away from that heaviness. Keep it light. Keep a sense of humor. Move your attention into the present moment. That 
break in the clouds can come. Then we're making the space for that break in the clouds and the sun to come in and to have a little bit more lightness and fun in in our workday. Because come on, you know, these creative jobs, they're they're 24 seven. I mean, you wake up in the middle of the night, and think, oh, that's an idea. God, can I jot that down? You know, it's like, that's the beauty of them, but they can also, uh, they take over because they're your passion. Uh, and we want that to happen, but we also have to be able to have some fun and, and have a sense of humor around it too. Susan, are there different approaches to using this, these techniques in terms of what it is that's going on, whether you didn't get the call back or somebody's just bothering you at the DMV or you had a fight with someone you love, would you say that there's different approaches then with the technique or would you say it's a catch-all? Yes and no. I'd say I'd say that the technique is very similar, but what's going to happen in each one of those situations is what you are bringing to the party. So for instance, if it's if you're at the DMV and you're just standing in line, Okay, so that's just plain old frustration, and that's a very different level of of upset than if you're having a very meaningful fight with somebody that you love, or if you have lost some work opportunity that you were very, very yeah. invested in. So it's really a matter of scale of what your response is as opposed to the technique. And I think I'm really glad you asked that question because what's important to remember is that the more emotional charge that you are working with when you're practicing mindfulness and meditation, especially early on, the more important it is to understand that there's all sorts of different ways in. So for instance, if you're in a situation that you're quite, quite emotional because of the argument with somebody you love or because of the loss of a very important uh, work opportunity, that might not be the best time for a meditation or mindfulness practice where you're sitting still. Yeah. Or where that you know, might be a better time for some movement practice, whether it's walking. In those situations, I love the practice thankful with every step. It's really one of my favorite practices of all time. And you can do it whether you're walking on a hike in the Santa Monica Mountains or if you're just going back and forth between the kitchen table and the sink. And what it is is just every time you take a step, you just remember, you say silently to yourself something you're thankful for. Yeah. So that helps ground you and it keeps you moving because when you're absolutely still, if you don't have a lot of practice, it can sometimes be very difficult to contain and to hold those emotions. And we don't have to. Another good thing to do when you're having a really hard time staying still because the emotions are running high. And it's something I wish I knew in that Zen center. And Kathy, I wish I had told you about before your day long <laughs> is just sway from side to side and give yourself a squeeze, give yourself a hug. The sensory soothing benefit of just holding on to your arms a little bit and slowly and with control, sitting upright but swaying from side to side it's another way of releasing that nervous energy and in a book that uh, Peter Levine wrote for about kids but it serves adults as well called trauma proofing your kids he writes about how to help calm down that excess nervous system energy which is what's happening when you're really upset about an argument with somebody you love or about the loss of an important job situation you need to release that energy and how to do it is with controlled movements coupled with quieting so that's why the going back and forth side to side is a controlled movement, but then you're also coming back into the center and staying still, or the walking and being thankful for every step is also a way of movement controlled, release of energy, but still some focus. So I think that's the real key is that it's not so much what is the trigger for the event, it's the amount of emotional charge that comes with it. And our way of dealing with what's happening, it, we have to modify our mindfulness method uh, based on just how difficult it is for us to be uh, holding these uh, everyday emotions. Yeah. I encourage all of you listening to follow Susan. She's Susan Kaiser Greenland, and she has two great books. One is called The Mindful Child, but I'm telling you, as a person who has read it many times, it is great for adults. And she has a new book called Mindful Games. Susan, where can people find you and how, how can they find more content that you're putting out? 
Um, my website, it's susankaisergreenland.com. And if that's a little long, you can also just go to innerkids.com and that'll go to the same website. And I'm very excited about that website now because one of my focuses in the coming year is to really build up the resources on the website. So I've been I've been adding blogs and I've been adding shout outs to different people in the field who are doing wonderful work so that I can use uh, the platform that I've developed in this uh, in this world of mindfulness with kids and families to shine a light on other good work that's out there. And so I encourage people to sign up for my newsletter. It's going to come out twice a week. Or, I'm sorry, twice a month, not twice a <laughs> week. And uh, with different resources and different uh, ideas so that you can integrate this into your life. Because I've got to tell you, the one thing that I have found in all of these years now of being out on the road in training adults in working with themselves and in working with kids and teens is that we can get very excited about it after a weekend workshop or after a half an hour class or something. But the real challenge is the ongoing practice. So The idea of the newsletter is to try to keep sending people reminders and new materials and new ways of looking at things to just keep reminding them to go back and just practice a short period of time many times throughout the day. As you go through the day, just take a moment to enjoy it. When you start feeling you know, the, those waves of emotions, or when you start feeling your body tighten up, Just take that as a moment to stop and move your attention away from what you're thinking into a sensory experience. Just relax, take a breath, and that's about it. I think it's a great takeaway what you just said. That practice would be incredibly powerful. As simple as that sounds, I've done it, and it winds up making a huge difference in your life. It's like, think about one degree. If you were to go one degree different on an airplane, you'd wind up in a totally different place. So it's like one degree of that in your life will make a huge difference. But And that slogan that you said, this is what it is right now. Yeah, this is what it is right Right. now. And just, I I guess if there was one thing, one takeaway that I wish people would take is to really keep it simple, keep it fun, and keep your sense of humor. That'll help us not take things quite so seriously, not take things quite so personally, and give us the energy that we need to, you know, put our necks out when we're trying something new, when we're trying to start a new job. Come on. I mean, I think we should all pat ourselves on the back for these creative pursuits. I mean, they're really scary to do, and it requires taking risks and putting your necks out and putting your own self and what you love and your passion on the line. So since you're doing that every single day, I just really, really hope people can appreciate that about themselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. Susan, thank you so much for making the time for us. I feel so calm just listening to you talk. Everybody in the room is so relaxed (laughs) right now. You should see everybody. Um, Thank you for the gift of you and who you are. And what I love about you is how human and real you are. And I said at the beginning, but you're just not pretentious. Like you'll talk about your own quest to be as peaceful as you can be. And you don't sit on some, you know, ivory tower looking down at all of us. And thank you for having that vulnerability. Well, I really struggle with anxiety. I That's why I got into this uh, over 20 years ago, and I'm better at it now, but I still do have a lot of anxiety. And so if I can do this, anybody can. Wow. Susan, thank you so much. That was so incredibly helpful, and it's so nice to listen to you. Here are some of the takeaways that I got from what you were saying. Number one, your great new slogan, which I love, this is what it is right now. Number two, learning to tolerate being uncomfortable and not resisting what you're feeling. Number three, acknowledging your emotions. Number four, thinking about positive things that are going on in your life when things are maybe a little bit difficult. Number five, not taking things personally, dismantling that ego. Number six, accepting that there's only so much you can control. Number seven, keeping it simple, having a sense of humor about things and having fun. And number eight, be proud of where you are. Be proud of where you are right now and that you're even going for this. All right, guys. Well, if you like this episode, if you're enjoying the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes and tell your friends about it. Say, come on, this is a great podcast. I'm learning so much. It's inspiring. We will be continuing to do what we are doing, putting out great content for you and by you subscribing. It helps us do that. You can follow us on Facebook at Don't Keep Your Day Job. It is always so much fun to share these episodes with you. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. 
I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street, and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com. 